What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats Podcast. I'm Phil Perry coming at you from Radio Row here in Las Vegas. Ahead of Super Bowl 58, we have a tremendous episode for you here today because we're talking to two quarterbacks, both incredibly bright, both have experience in what the Patriots' offensive scheme appears it will be in 2024 under Alex Van Pelt. We know he has Brown's background under Kevin Stefanski, who has background under Gary Kubiak, who once hired Kyle Shanahan to be his offensive coordinator. Kubiak, also a longtime assistant of Mike Shanahan. That Shanahan tree is everywhere across the NFL. It is, in a way, here in New England now, too. So what is it about that scheme that Patriots fans should be excited about? Specifically, how does that scheme help young quarterbacks? We're all expecting the Patriots to make a transition at that position, maybe even use the number three overall pick on a passer. Why is this offense good for that player? We're talking to Matt Ryan, former NFL MVP. He won that award when he was playing in Kyle Shanahan's offense in Atlanta. Dan Orlovsky as well during his playing days. He played in this offense. He loves this offense. Let's start, though, with our conversation with Matt Ryan. We're going to get deep into the nitty-gritty when it comes to the X's and O's with this Shanahan-style scheme we think we're going to be seeing at Foxborough. Very excited now to have with us on Next Pats the great Matt Ryan. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. My yeah, friend. happy to be on with you. I cannot believe... It has been 10 years since the Ice Bucket Challenge started. Pete Frady's obviously made such a massive impact on our area, yeah. being in the New England area, the Boston area. Tell us what you're doing for the Ice Bucket Challenge and its 10th anniversary right here on Radio Row. Yeah, just out here kind of, you know, reminding people that it's been 10 years and, and creating awareness for ALS research and finding medicines to, you know, make a cure for this. Um, I, I'm personally attached because you mentioned Pete. Pete was a buddy of mine at BC. He was one of the first guys I actually met when I got to Boston College on orientation. Uh, he was in, you know, we, we were in this like eight-man dorm uh, at orientation, and he was one of the guys in the room. And so I, I've, I got to know him uh, immediately, and uh, such a good guy, and and such a good friend, and kind of he was so loyal. And then, you know, to see what the disease did to him, uh, and the impact that it had on his family too. For me, it was like I want to help in whatever way I can to, to try and get behind this and, um, you know, find ways to make it better for, for people with ALS and find ways to end it. And, and I think that's going to be uh, something that we continue to work on and, and try and find a way to get it done. I also got to give a shout out to both the Falcons organization and New Orleans Saints organization. Uh, they've done a great job of, of creating awareness for it, and I'm trying to continue that today. Well, it's such a great cause. Hopefully our viewers, our listeners, can contribute to that cause, support the cause, and continue to do the Ice Bucket Challenge. That's right. I'm going to do it a little later on today. I've done it oh. before, so i got to find out who, who who's getting uh, who's getting called out now, by me as well. Now, what's your technique? Do you do you like to, to dump the ice bucket on yourself, or do you have someone else do it, catch you by surprise a little bit? Nah, I kind of want to know when it's coming. Yeah. You know, okay. I feel like the cold plunge is all the rage now. You know, I feel, I feel like the ALS Ice Bucket <laughs> Challenge was a little bit before their time. Uh, no so question. I've been doing some cold plunging, and, and I feel like I'm prepared for uh, for it today. Classic quarterback, right? You just want to be in control. Well, you yeah. want to have control I'm over control your situation. Freak. There's exactly. No yeah, you're not the only one. Yes. Let, let's talk a little bit of football, and, and specifically about the offense that you were in in Atlanta. You just mentioned the Falcons. Kyle Shanahan, obviously coaching in this year's Super Bowl. The reason why it's of interest to us in New England, Matt, is because there is a change offensively happening in Foxborough right now. Yep. And they seem to be adopting a scheme that is somewhat similar. Alex Van Pelt is the offensive coordinator now. Never worked under Kyle Shanahan, but worked under Kevin Stefanski, who is Gary Kubiak ties. There's a, if you draw a big enough tree, you can make the link there, right? But, yeah, I mean, the NFL's very, for lack of a better term, inbred, it right? Is. It's, it is. There, yes. There's a lot of, uh, of carryover between staffs. and um, But really, that Gary Kubiak influence uh, is massive, right? It goes all the way back to Mike Shanahan. I mean, we, we can continue to take this further back. Right. Um, but it starts with the outside zone uh, in, in the run game. And so to me, when you look at a guy like Alex Van Pelt coming in, I think it's going to be about establishing that run, getting the run game going, stretching the field horizontally, and then – you know, finding ways to get the play action pass going uh, off of that. And I think right now, if, if you look at the best offenses in the NFL, this is kind of the mold that they're going in. And so I expect them to be better. I mean, 
it was kind of hard to watch uh, in New England. You know, the last couple of years offensively, what they were doing. I know they played good defense, but getting back to you know being a little bit more balanced of a football team, playing good offense, playing good defense, running the football. I think that recipe uh, is the one that they want to get back towards. Why is that system so beneficial for quarterbacks? And maybe even especially Matt young quarterbacks if you could speak to that because it does look like they're making a transition at that position potentially yeah I think I think one of the things you know running the football does is take some of the pressure off you on first and second down and you know as a quarterback your money's made on third down and in the red zone and you've got to step up you've got to make plays in those situations but when there's too much on you on first and second down uh and and that wears you know, like you're trying to find ways to make plays 65, 70 plays a game, it wears on you. And I think some of what they do running the football takes the stress off you. Number one, you can hand that thing off. But number two, it starts to get guys open. It get guys open in the play action pass game and it simplifies what you have to do, right? You're you're going off that play action, you're looking for these deep crossers, not there, you're checking it down, and it's putting a lot of stress on a defense. And uh, to me, it was always one of the things I liked as, as a quarterback in that system. What do you think is the biggest challenge of that system? I think about young quarterbacks now. We're looking at these guys that are at the top of the draft. Patriots have the number three overall pick. You were taken with the number three overall pick yeah. back in 08. Is it you're under center much more? Is it about trusting what the coaching staff is telling you? Because we hear a lot about that element to that scheme yeah. with Kyle Shanahan. What do you think is, is the toughest part about it? Well, I think depending on how they want to set the run game up, I think getting under center now for guys coming from college is probably one of the bigger challenges. Uh, for me, it wasn't, right? Like when I was at Boston College, we were under center, man. We were running that ball from under center. Uh, and so I was very comfortable doing that. I think you mentioned, though, the timing and the trust. To me, that's probably uh, the most difficult part because if you are under center and you're going in that play action, you're turning your back to the line of scrimmage for a long time. And they throw a lot of short post and crossing routes, which require you to get it out on that first hitch, right? That back foot's gonna hit, you're gonna hitch into it. You better see a spot and try and drive that ball into a space. And a lot of times it's muddy, but they run kind of through that muddy area and find an opening. I think that's one of the hardest things as a young player is to trust that the spacing and the timing is gonna uh, beat you know, these, these coverages that they have in the back end. I mentioned when you were taken in the draft, the last thing I wanna ask you is because the Patriots might be investing that pick in a quarterback, I wanna ask you about makeup. And I wonder, from your perspective, because, you know, your name was Matty Ice. Yeah. We just had Ted Karras here at the Cincinnati yeah. Bengals. He's talking about Joe Cool, Joe Burrow. Makeup feels like the toughest thing to scout. We can all see what's on the tape. We can all see what you guys do on TV. Who would have been, for you coming out of college, your best references when it came to your makeup? Because I think that's going to be the biggest question mark for the Patriots as they scout these guys near the top of the draft. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think back on – you know, my experience of finishing up college, going through that combine process, and, and then ultimately ending up in Atlanta and hearing the stories of who they went to, right? And so my last year at BC, we had a coaching staff change. And so, you know, they would go in and they would ask Jeff Jagosinski and Steve Logan, who coached me at the time, a little bit about me. But they spent a lot of time going to NC State where Tom O'Brien left to go and that staff. And it wasn't just Tom O'Brien, right? They would go into the strength coach, Todd Rice, they would go into the coordinator, Dana Bible, the running back coach who recru uh, recruited me, Jason Swepson. They spent an extended time down the line of, of maybe not the people that you would think to go talk about. What's he like day to day? What's his personality? Because to me, you can fake it for an interview. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you can pull yourself together for 15, 20 minutes and, and come across a certain way, but you're not able to fake it for four or five years, being around somebody and what you're like day to day and what your mind you know, your mindset and, and your makeup is like. And so to me, I think you've got to find people that are around them all the time, uh, that understand who that person is so you can get a deep dive into what they're going to be like day to day for you. I love it. Great conversation, Matt. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Listeners, viewers, make sure you're participating in the Ice Bucket Challenge in its 10th year. Thanks again, Matt. Know you're busy, guys, so we appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's get to now the Orlovsky portion of the program. He has watched these quarterbacks that are all presumed to be top of the draft types of players this year, I think you're going to find it very interesting which quarterback he prefers and prefers for the Patriots. Very interesting comp to C.J. Stroud is what Dan Orlovsky will throw at you in this chat. Let's get to Orlovsky right now.
Very excited to have with us now the great Dan Orlovsky, ESPN. Dan, thanks for spending some time with us here, man. We're going to talk some quarterbacks. Uh, you ready to talk some quarterbacks? Yeah, yeah. I am, I am, I hope always ready to do that. Patriots need one. It looks that way at least. Sure. They're drafting at number three you know, overall. You know where I, my heart is not well, right. I, we know you're, you, you do have an appreciation Jones. for Mac Jones, yeah. and so we can ask you about Mac Jones. I want to ask you first, though. This looks like a quote unquote three quarterback draft at the very top. Some people will say that at least. Caleb Williams, yeah. Drake May, Jaden Daniels. If you're there at number three and you're drafting for New, Eng- New England, who do you hope falls to you in that slot? Yeah, at right now in the first week of February, my initial thought is Jaden Daniels. Um, obviously, as we get into the back end of April and studying those guys, one, I've, I've called basically all these guys' games outside of Caleb. The reason I say Jaden is... Um, I called a couple of games in early the 2022 season and, you know, down at LSU, there was this at least like internal thought of like, are we going to move on from Jaden Daniels? Were they going to bench him? Because they were he, they were concerned that he was so hesitant that he wasn't trusting anything. Now, obviously, this was early on in the transfer phase and whatnot. And to see where it went from there to obviously how this season went from for him, you're, you're intrigued of like the mental toughness. And also you got to see the comfort and when he is comfortable, that talent shine. Um, I had to do a couple tapes uh, about three or four weeks ago. So I I watched a couple of his games. I'm not saying he's this guy, but when I watched the games, the overwhelming thought was pure as a passer from the pocket. It's the same thought that I had when I watched CJ Stroud last year. Just when you watch them in the pocket, you're like, man, it's just so pure. The, 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 the throwing motion. I'm a big throwing motion guy. I call it, it's just a smooth stroke and he's got that. Like, and I, again, I'm not totally into studying these guys, but I think I feel confident saying just pure pocket passer wise and the different types of throws. He's the guy that I think is the best at that. I don't want to go too far afield, but I do like the comp and talking about the way they throw. And I've heard the comp of Randall Cunningham who had a beautiful long flowing throwing motion is there anything to that comp obviously randall cunningham is one of the greatest running quarterbacks of all time that might be a stretch to project Jaden daniels in that way but is randall cunningham someone else you could go further back and say maybe a little like that yeah i think just the ability to throw is there randall's throwing motion was longer very you you know like Jaden's. that's why i said cj like Jaden's is very tight and compact it's what we call like super nerd football stuff. It's a, it's a small C rather than a yeah. big C. You know, they show that all the time on in, on Sunday Night Football. Yeah, Collins Chris Collins was yes. big on the ball yes, comes straight up. Absolutely. So he's got this very tight small C, and his offhand stays close to his chest, and he's a rotational thrower. So you could see he's had really good coaching in that regard. So, but but as far as like if you just threw a ball down on the ground and said, hey, pick it up and go throw this. This guy's going to run 20 yards and go in. Yeah, I could see that, just the pure talent of it, yes. I want to ask you this on scheme. The Patriots are a blank slate. Well, offensively, they have very few players that you say we're building around that. They're bringing in Alex Van Pelt as their offensive coordinator. They're then going to bring in a veteran quarterback who may or may not fit exactly what Alex wants to do. Do you go scheme, then quarterback, or do you go quarterback, then scheme, or do you have to adopt a scheme in the next however many months? that is ambiguous enough to fit anyone into it. What do you do when you're a blank slate, but you have two checkpoints, free agency and then draft? Yeah, I think if we're talking the, the veteran quarterback, I, I think you go with the, the scheme first. Like what guy do we think can come in and play at a give us a chance to win level in this scheme? Because that's obviously the goal. If we're talking young player, like a draft quarterback, quarterback over everything. A- absolutely. Um you know, in regards to the offense and Alex, I like the fact that he's been – has a history in the Mick Shanahan tree. You know, that – in Green McShanahan. Bay. Yeah, <laughs> took me a that, second. That's a hardball thing. I stole it from him. But, you know, Stints in Green Bay and obviously the background in Cleveland. So, I'm a big fan of that offense. I always think it helps quarterbacks play better than their physical talent necessarily should allow them to. But I do think um, you, you – you, you, if it's a veteran guy, you want a guy that – no, like, hey, if he's got to start week one, he's going to play good football in this system. But at the end of the day, like, if we're going to take a young kid, it, it the scheme, we can always change. You can't change the player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does look like it's going to be this McShanahan tree type of offense. Van right. Pelt, 
worked with Stefanski, who worked with Kubiak, who worked with Mike Shanahan. So it's he's he's in a roundabout way part of that tree. What is it about that offense, that scheme? Yeah that allows quarterbacks to get more out of their physical talent than maybe other schemes would. I've heard people refer to this offense as almost a quarterbacking cheat code. Yes. Why is that? It's a great question. So I played in this offense. Um, it's my favorite offense to be around in the NFL. There's a couple reasons why. Uh, number one, it never mentally bogs down quarterbacks. A lot of times quarterbacks have a ton of responsibility pre-snap. You're identifying fronts and changing protections. It's not a big part of this offense. It happens at times, but it's not a big part. Those guys, Kubiak and Shanahan always wanted the quarterbacks to just play fast. Um, second of all, there's a consistency to it because it's so dependent upon, hey, our feet tell us when and where to throw. And if you get into your first or second hitch and the ball's not to that first or second option, we're getting the ball out. So it minimizes mistakes. It also promotes aggression because you rep so much hey, on this ball fake or whatnot and my back foot hits, I'm ripping this 12 yard in route if that linebacker takes one step to his left. So you become a very convicted player. Now it leads to a pick error there, but you know more often than not, the conviction plays well. Two, I think it is we go through. You got you guys know this. We go through waves in the NFL of what's the trend. I think it's trend and different. You know, it, it is a scheme that whether we're you know in the early 2000s and Jake everyone's Plummer. playing Tampa two, yes, <laughs> and and cover three, and and we're in a little bit shrunk down formations. You can run everything out of that. And then we get into the early 2010s and into the middle of the 2015 era where it's more spread out and RPO centric. This still lives. And it's one of those offense that does never loses its identity. If I have a run play and it's out of this formation and this look and it's going to left, I'm going to have two or three pass plays that are out of this formation and this action and it's going to look left. And I think, you know, that, that that's one of the fundamental principles is they don't just call plays. They build game plans. Th those that offense builds a game plan and it's all t attached to each other the reason i blurted out jake Plummer is because he was under mike shanahan the quarterback for denver and he hadn't had a great career until that point and he ran beautifully the shanahan offense yeah. and he had the attributes like yourself tall long mobile enough to move outside the pocket bootleg and do all those things so you could look at a Jaden daniels being able to certainly drake may to do that as yeah. well a little longer um i'm wondering this I keep saying this to Phil, and I say it to anybody who'll listen. Wrong place, wrong time for the Patriots to take a quarterback this year. The team's too bad. Build the offensive line, find the receiver, trade down, have two first-round picks for next year, and then if you want to, go up to five, go up to four, get your quarterback then, or find the veteran. You can turn Gardner Minshew into Jake Plummer all over again. I, I don't disagree with that. I, I say this all the time. Outside of, I think, Joe Burrow... You know, we don't see a lot of top five quarterbacks get drafted and all of a sudden flip bad franchises. Now, I'm not saying New England's a bad franchise. They've obviously had a down three or four year stretch, given obviously the success. Um, so, it, you know, if they were at one and maybe two, I would feel a little bit differently. I would sit there and go, no, no, no. Because Caleb Williams is such a rare talent. He's flawed. But my goodness, his playmaking ability is is rare. Um, that I would say you, you got to take one, but or take him at that spot. But if you sit there and go, you know what, we don't, you know, Drake May's mechanically too sloppy, and he's there at three, and we don't love that. Or you know, Jaden Daniels is. Some people say he's going to be too thin for some teams' likings. We don't like that. I completely agree because this isn't. This didn't be. They didn't move on from Coach Belichick because of one bad year. The roster is. It became what it yes. became. We all know that. And so I don't I don't disagree that unless you think the guy that you love is there at three, there's, there's never the right time. Okay, and if you do that, right, so say you, you move back, you take your tackle, you wait on a quarterback because your team's not ready to bring in that young player at that all-important position, are we looking at a scenario where Mac Jones comes back and in this offense, you know, it was interesting, before the 2021 draft, it sounded as though Kyle Shanahan himself loved Mac Jones, yeah. right? Would you be willing to, or should the Patriots, I'll just ask you flatly, should the Patriots keep Mac Jones and see what he can be in this new scheme? Yes. Now, I'm, I'm, everyone says, like, in my industry, you're not ha allowed to have biases or whatnot. I obviously believe that Mac Jones is a good player. I think he's a much better player than he's been shown. So I say yes, and, like, the, the, the counter to question, my question, what's the downside? 
Like if you're not taking a quarterback in the top three, you're obviously signifying, hey, there's other parts of our team that aren't good enough right now that we want to build up. And while you're always trying to win every game, you have to be realistic about your football team. What would be the downside? So if, if you do that, let's live in the hypothetical world that you do that. Mac Jones plays and he stinks again. Great. Cool. There's, there's no downside to that. You're going to have an early draft pick. Sucks to lose all that. Mac Jones plays really good. Then you're in a situation where you get you get a, you're in control. You got leverage. We can still go get a quarterback in the draft. We'll have an extra pick more than likely, or we can move forward with Mac. You can trade Mac Jones. Like there's a lot that can happen. And um, I, again, I, I still believe that Mac is a better player than he played as last year. If you don't take a quarterback and you don't trade down, Marvin Harrison, you get your receiver the you same way all these. Chase. Yeah, you you get your guy. I I, I don't. Marvin's going to be a spectacular NFL pro. But you got to get a quarterback the year after then. Then that's Gardner Minshew. Minshew, Mac Jones, Marvin Harrison, the NFL. You'll love it, don't you? Dan Orlovsky, ESPN. <laughs> we could talk quarterbacks and scheme all day long. Thanks so much for being with us. My Thank pleasure. you. My pleasure. Great stuff there from Dan Orlovsky. Obviously, still a fan of Mac Jones's game. He's not the only one. We talked to Rich Gannon out here. We talked to Steve Young out here. Jacoby Myers here on the Next Pats podcast. All of these people still in the game, still studying the game very closely, some of whom know that quarterback position very, very well and what it takes to succeed there, they still believe in Mac Jones. He may need a change of scenery, though, and if the Patriots end up going with a quarterback, Jaden Daniels would be, at least as of right now, Dan Orlovsky's pick. And if he's running this Van Pelt offense, which has similarities to what the Niners are doing with Kyle Shanahan, to what the Rams are doing, with Sean McVay, maybe it allows that young player to have success right away. Helps jumpstart this Patriots rebuild. That's it for this edition of the Next Pats podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks to Matt Ryan. Thanks to Dan Orlovsky. Thanks to Jacoby Myers. Thanks to Eric Eager. We are loaded with podcast interviews that we have banked this week that we're going to continue to roll out in the very near future. So keep it locked on Next Pats as always. And we'll talk to you next time.